In this video, we're going to talk about how we develop angle between two vectors in any inner product space. So well, to make that work, we need to talk about what's referred to as the Cauchy-Schwarz inequality. So you, talk, you start with uh, two vectors in the inner pro product space. Then the absolute value of the inner product of u and v has to be less than or equal to the product of the magnitudes of u and v. So the proof of this requires a little bit of ingenuity. So we'll start with a scalar in R, and then we're going to consider the magnitude squared of this vector tu plus v. Well, certainly since we're taking a magnitude and squaring it, we know the magnitude squared cannot be negative. It has to be greater than or equal to zero. Using our definition of magnitude, and specifically magnitude squared, we know that's the inner product with the vector with itself. And then we can use the algebraic properties of the inner product to basically do something that looks like foiling. So when we do the distributive properties and use the properties where we can pull out the constants, we get this t squared with, uh, times the inner product of u with itself, a 2t times the inner product of u and v, and then plus an inner product of v with itself. And you can see that here basically looks like a FOIL idea, right? tu times tu gives me a t squared u squared. This kind of looks like u squared. We get a tuv and a tuv, so we got 2t uv, and then we got a v squared. So it looks like a foiling idea. And that's exactly what we have using those properties of the inner product. Now, going back to that magnitude squared, we know that that's non-negative. Well, notice that this is quadratic in t, which means that if I think about it as um, a graph of a quadratic, we know that's a parabola that opens up or a parabola that opens down. And since this says it's always greater than or equal to zero, we have some parabola that opens up that might come down and hit the x-axis and go back up, if we think about it graphically. Now, we know that this can't cross the x-axis because if it crossed it, then this expression would be negative and we would have this less than zero. So it can't cross it. It can come down and touch it, but it can't cross it. So that means that if we think to the quadratic formula, when we have that plus or minus the square root piece on the end, if that's a positive number, we get two distinct roots. We don't have two distinct roots. We have at most one and probably none, which means that that radical piece can't be positive. It could be zero or it's undefined. So that means that the underneath part of the square root or the discriminant, that b squared minus 4ac part, must be non-positive. It's zero or less than zero. So your discriminant part, the b squared minus 4ac, the b of course is the coefficient on the t. Well the coefficient on the t is the 2 times the inner product of u and v. So here's your b squared, your minus 4ac, your a is the coefficient on the t squared, so that's the u inner product with itself. Your c is the constant, that's the v inner product with itself. A little bit more algebra, <coughs> pardon me. Squaring this just gives me 4 times the square of the inner product, and then we've got 4 times the magnitude squared for u and the magnitude squared for v. That's, the that's just by the definitions there. Divide by 4 and take the square root. When we do the square root of something square, we get absolute value, and so this is our result. Let's see if we can put this to an immediate application before we talk about angle. Let's talk about the, what's referred to as the triangle inequality, and this pops up in actually several other walks of mathematics, if you will. comes up a lot in different other areas where we have to use this particular inequality for, well, numbers in general, but lots of different uh, ideas. So if we have two vectors that are in an inner product space, then if I do the magnitude, the norm of u plus v, it has to be less than or equal to the norm of u plus the norm of v. So why do we call it the triangle inequality? Well, if I think about taking the vector u, and then putting tip to tail on v here, the one that goes from the initial point for u and the, t the end, the tail point for v here, the terminal point, that vector is u plus v, and you get a triangle, if we think of these as real vectors, if you will, in Euclidean space. So that's why we call this a triangle inequality, because what it says is that the sum of the links of two sides of the triangle must be greater than or equal to the length of the third side. That's why we call it the triangle inequality. You've probably seen that in a geometry class. All right, so let's, let's see how this proof goes. I'll start with the square of the magnitude. This is a pretty typical way to start these proofs. Square of the magnitude is the inner product of the vector with itself. And just like we talked about above, 
that looks like a foiling idea. So I basically foiled it out just using the product, uh, the properties of the inner product. And now I know from the Cauchy Swartz inequality that if I replace, oh, I'm sorry, that's not Cauchy Swartz yet. If I replace this, which could be negative, with its absolute value, I've at worst kept it the same and probably made it bigger, right? I can't make it smaller by taking the absolute value of a single piece here. So this piece here is certainly less than or equal to this piece here. All right. Now, uh, this is just notation. U inner product with itself is magnitude U squared. This is magnitude V squared. So this equal, equal sign means that it's equal from this step to this step. Now we'll use cauchy Schwartz. I know that the product of the magnitudes is greater than the absolute value of the inner product. And now I can factor on that right-hand side and get that the magnitude of u plus v squared is the magnitude of u plus the magnitude of v all squared. And it might be cut off on the bottom of your screen. But all I did was just rewrite the left-hand side here down at the bottom. And this is just factored. This is a perfect square. And then if you take square roots of both sides, you get exactly what we want for our result. Uh, this should be a less than or equal to sign here in the middle, by the way. So this, this equality referred to it was equal here, but this should be less than or equal here because I've got less than or equal to in a couple of spots. So that's a triangle inequality, and notice it involved the cauchy schwartz inequality. Well, how does this apply to angle between vectors? Well, certainly since we have that the absolute value of the inner product is less than or equal to the product of the norms, if I, divide, if I rewrite my absolute value and divide by this, I get that this quotient has to be between negative 1 and 1. So we can define the angle between the two vectors as theta. For any inner product space, we can do this, where the cosine of theta is going to be the inner product of u and v divided by the product of the magnitudes. And the reason why I need this between negative 1 and 1 is because if I want to be able to do the inverse cosine. And I can't do the inverse cosine unless I'm guaranteed to be in between negative 1 and 1. Why did we use inverse cosine rather than, say, inverse sine? Well, inverse sine, of course, gives you an angle between minus pi over 2 and pi over 2. And we'd rather have our angle between vectors here to be something that's a positive number. And inverse cosine's range is from 0 to pi. So we can from 0 to 180 degrees. Let's concentrate specifically on um, when ha what happens when your theta is pi over 2. Well, if I have theta is pi over 2, I get 0 on this left-hand side. Um, assuming I have non-zero vectors on the bottom here, well, just in general, I have non-zero vectors. I have non-zero numbers here on the bottom, which means that in order for the cosine to be equal to zero, I have to have the top equal to zero. So this is pi over two precisely when the inner product is equal to zero. And I chose pi over two because that's a 90 degree angle. That says something about the, geometrically, it says something about the vectors being perpendicular. We give it a fancy name in linear algebra. If we have two vectors in an inner product space such that their inner product is zero, we say that those two vectors are orthogonal. And orthogonal vectors have exceptionally nice properties with regards to generating subspaces of uh, vector spaces, especially when we're talking about functions. Orthogonality is a really, really helpful thing to have if, if you uh, are trying to figure out coordinates with respect to a basis in particular. We'll talk about that later. All right, so this gives us the idea, this orthogonal piece will give us the idea of being able to prove what's referred to as the Pythagorean theorem. And you'll notice that, again, we thought this was the third side of the triangle, so this looks like a squared plus b squared equals c squared. So if u and v are orthogonal, we know that the magnitude squared of u plus v is the same as the magnitude of u squared plus the magnitude of v squared. And this proof isn't bad. We're going to do the same thing that we've done several times now. Take the magnitude squared, write it as its inner product with itself, and distribute, FOIL if you will. This is magnitude of u squared. This is magnitude of v squared. And they're orthogonal. The definition of being orthogonal is that they're zero. So we just get magnitude of u plus magnitude, or magnitude of u squared plus magnitude of v squared. So we get another proof, if you will, of the Pythagorean theorem that's uh, one that would be in Euclidean space using a vector proof. 
Um, if you're interested in a little side note, there are a whole bunch of proofs of the Pythagorean theorem. If you're taking history of math, you've probably seen a few of them or will see a few of them, but there's a whole bunch of proofs for the Pythagorean theorem. So anyway, I just wanted to give you a little introduction into angle between vectors and notice that we can define this in terms of any inner product space and uh, doesn't matter that it's Euclidean or not.